Welcome to Ortho Insider. It's the podcast from the Canadian Orthopedic Association that goes behind the scenes of orthopedics in Canada. I'm your host for the inaugural season. My name is Dr. Adrian Huang. And today we have Dr. Pierre Guy. This is a very special moment for me because not only is he a professor of surgery at the Department of Orthopedics at University of British Columbia, and the head of orthopedics at Vancouver General Hospital. He is also my personal mentor, and he taught many of the courses that I was at as a fellow in orthopedic trauma at both the OTA and the AO meetings. Currently, you are the president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association. That's right. So thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be on Author Insider. Well, it's really nice to have homegrown talent. You know, you're right up the street from where I work at St. Paul's Hospital. So it's really nice to be able to do this in person with you. I've always been really interested because you've been such a, like a mentor figure to me. How did you get started in orthopedics? Tell me a little bit about your road. Everybody's got their own road. Mine started actually thinking that I would be an engineer. My dad's a civil engineer and uh, has a construction company. I've worked in construction throughout the summers uh, growing up. And I was thinking that's probably what I would do. I liked sciences, I liked physics, and then uh, when it came time to decide and to apply to uh, university, so I was in Quebec, so out of CJEP, mm. I really liked the biological sciences. So I said, well, I'll apply to medicine and see what happens. So I applied to that, and of course I, you know, I enjoyed it, and then uh, first rotation ever is a surgical rotation. <laughs> I'm the clerk, and then I'm first sent to the plastics uh, hand clinic, and then the chief resident, as soon as I show up, says, okay, you go see this patient over there. They got the K-wires. You pull those out. Awesome. And I'm going, what? what, what? So he says, yeah, just do whatever nurse tells you to do, which actually has been an axiom, something that I've followed throughout my career. Nurses usually are excellent teachers to, to doctors. So, so I go ahead and do that. We finish the hand clinic. And the uh, chief resident says, okay, once you pop up to the operating room right now, they're going to do this really interesting case. Unfortunately, this patient had this injury. Mm. So this is a fellow who worked for Hydro-Quebec, so you know the, the uh, Hydro Provincial Organization, and he, uh, w- he fell from, a, from a, a post, and he had bilateral open tibia fractures, and it required fasciotomies. There they were, they'd washed out the legs, they'd put these frames, because they used to put external fixators, these frames on the legs, and now they were taking skin away from his body and they were meshing that to put that on top. And then I said, this is it. That's awesome. This is engineering and medicine. And um, I've not looked back. I've been fortunate enough after that through medical school, having uh, good mentors uh, who were orthopedic surgeons who guided my way and, and suggested various things to do. And, and yeah, here I am now. So that's amazing because That is such a unique first experience. Not everyone gets that. Most people are say, you know, go to clinic, go see this, you know, patient, do a consultation. But you were thrown right into the fire, take out some K-wires, go see this classic orthoplastics trauma case, bilateral open tibias. Has that now shaped the way you teach people? Because you are a very engaging instructor. I mean, I'm sure it's influenced it. I mean, I, I've, I had also very good you know, teachers and mentors, and some of them were actually engineers. What I, I got from that is they taught principles. There's lots of mechanics that we do. This is a great fun part of, of our work, right? Yeah. And then throughout the years, what I've chosen to do in you know, my research work uh, is I associate a lot with engineers, mechanical engineers, right. materials engineers, electrical engineers. On the clinical side, you know, I, I do try to, to pass on what I was passed to me. So teach by principles, mm-hmm. because certainly in trauma, I think in many fields of orthopedics, but understanding how the, you know, what the procedure that we're doing, how that will affect, you know, the mechanical component or how the body will react to it or, or how we can use mechanics to solve a problem, I think is key to, to many of the, the different uh, conditions or situations that we face. So, so yeah, that has, a, has a, had a huge influence. You also speak about your mentors and how you yeah. had wonderful mentors. And that seems to be a recurring theme of anyone in not just orthopedics, but medicine and anyone who's been successful. Tell me about the importance of mentorship for you, how you try to give that to your kind of up and coming trainees? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's very important. We, we all, we're interested, we're keen, we want to learn, but I think uh, helping us find our way and uh, and it uh, it doesn't have to be directing. You know, I, I never had anybody tell me do this. They, you know, un- unless I was really, really f- way out. Yeah, right. <laughs> field. But, uh, but, you know, it was always guiding, like yeah. suggesting and saying, okay, listen, you know, this is what you're goal is that's what your plan is if I understand this right so what about you consider this I thought that was a good approach I mean we're all 
at those stages in our lives, you know, intelligent people. And it's a matter of, you know, trying to get somebody to have a sounding board and, and you know. Fine tune a little bit. Fine tune, exactly. Yeah, no, that's help you, more, help you find your way. And it's always been the same. So if anybody out there feels like they're lost, it's it's been like that for everybody yes. along the way. So, you know, we've been uh, thankful to have mentors to, to help us along the way. So Absolutely. I think it's such an important thing to have mentors. The, that classic thing of we all stand on the shoulders of giants, I think is absolutely true uh, in orthopedics. Because, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be here without people like yourself. So it's wonderful. One of the questions I always get from early year trainees is how do I find a mentor? And it's not one of those things where you can just be assigned somebody because, you know, your personalities may not be perfectly aligned. Or, so do you have any suggestions for that? So I think people have tried that, kind of the assigning the mentor. And that, as you said, that doesn't necessarily work. I think it's probably a little bit trial and error. Mm. I think it's, you know, conversations. You know, there's sometimes people uh, align well. People find that uh, they, they uh, you, f you find that you're listened to. I think would be the one component of that. And as somebody who has, uh, has you know, your best interest in mind, um, I think you'll find that, but, you know, a lot of teachers and faculty members will have your best interest in mind. But I think if you really find that they're, they're supportive and, and they're listening to um, what you, your needs are or what, you know, what you're interested in, I think would be the way to go. But it, it won't be immediate. It might not happen right away, so be patient. Yeah, and I think in the early stages of your career, too, when you don't necessarily have that one mentor or the couple mentors, Turning towards your peers as a sounding board is also really good because you're kind of living as a first year resident. You're living it, you know, with them. You know, those long hours. So it's always nice to just have someone to be able to talk these things through. Oh yeah, and then that that happens a lot. I mean, it's I'm sure you've experienced that. I've experienced that as a as a junior resident where you know the chief essentially would kind of show you the way and then help you out and, and guide you. So I think yeah, we're all dependent on that. And, that's what I love about our specialty. Maybe that happens in all the specialties, but I think that's particularly true in our field. You know, I consider everybody who you know enters our specialty, you know, they're individuals in society who've you know gone to university, gone to medical school. You know, they're these are smart people. It's a matter of us finding a way and, and guiding the way. So that's awesome. We have this opportunity, this wonderful opportunity, sitting here in beautiful Vancouver, BC. We are perhaps a little more environmentally conscious. You yourself are quite environmentally conscious as an orthopedic surgeon. So tell us how that has affected your mandate as COA president and just your work on a daily basis. Well, I have to be uh, really truthful here that it uh, it's, doesn't come naturally for me. It comes from my wife, Dr. Linda Thayer. Uh, she's a family physician and, and an active, and she's active in the sustainability and environmental movement. But that's been her whole life. Mm. So she uh, grew up in the southeastern British Columbia and uh, being responsible uh, with our, our environment, being respectful of environment, being respectful of other people around us um, has always been key uh, an, an important part of um, the way her family made decisions and that's how um, she grew up and, and that's the person she is and through her various readings and all this I learned a lot from her and uh, and then a lot of the choices that we make in our daily lives mm -hmm. and as a family um, are have been influenced uh, by that from there I think I've you know I've been uh, trying to be a, an ally and supporter that in mind, I support at home, but also she's aware. I'm in you know various um, leadership positions. I'm uh, head of orthopedics at the Vancouver Acute, so Vancouver General Hospital and UBC Hospital, and now president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association. So she challenges me. So what are you going to do now that you're in these positions? I think that's important. I think it's something that we have to do and we, it's important that we do. It's not for ourselves. Yes, of course, there's some kind of immediate benefit, but I think we have to think over the long term. My wife has also done a lot of reading around the indigenous ways. Mm. So thinking seven generations beyond you no, is really how decisions uh, should be made. So I think that's that's been um, an important guiding principle. So what can we do? to help that and the future generations. And, and I think there's there's opportunity. There's other like minds, you know, in Canada who are in our orthopedics who are interested in, in doing that. So I've spoken to a few people already and, and that's one of the things I would like to do this year is to uh, put together the sustainability committee. I've spoken about various things to the board and then that's gonna be an ongoing discussion, but but it's a, it's a reality. One of the turning points I would say was uh, when Linda said, well, we have a choice. We can either make 
changes now, they're going to be significant. Or we can make really, really, really painful, urgent changes without the time to reflect in the future. So which one do you want? Because it's, it's not going away. No, this is enough evidence to support that we need to, to change our ways. You could bring up a really a couple of really interesting points. First of all, that idea of kind of going, going back to the roots and being tenders of the environment as opposed to users. You know, as orthopedic surgeons, I heard this, read this stat that says in one case, we generate two weeks worth of equivalent household garbage, yeah. which is incredible because if you think about all the things we open, you know, everything is sterile packed like three times. Yeah. So, and it's all plastic and it's yeah. a lot of it's not recyclable. I think it's wonderful that we're going to have some action on this. I, I mean, I, maybe that's what you're quoting, but there's an interesting study by Doug Dowdy um, out of London who uh, had published that. He looked, he's an arthroplasty surgeon. He had looked at the waste um, that's associated with a knee replacement, and then he scaled that up to all the knee replacements done in Canada, and the, the number was astounding. So that type of you know highlighting uh, an issue like that uh, requires you to engage uh, surgeons, uh, you know, operating rooms, people who work in operating rooms, but also all the way back up to industry. I don't think we're taking the bite that big just yet, but I think um, identifying and bringing together people who are interested in that topic and who want to do something about it as a, for a natural first step. And the other thing you brought up, which was also very interesting, that idea of generational thinking. Nowadays, it's hard to get people to think past their own generation or even their kids' generations. But back in the day, it takes 300 years to build a pyramid or a, a church or a cathedral. How do we get people to go back to this generational type thinking and, like you said, make those easier decisions now rather than really, really tough decisions three generations from now? Um, I think it's hard, but I think uh, I'm inspired by some of the thinking of the past and yeah. some of the you know, thinking of the keepers of our lands in Canada. Uh, so I think that's one way to, to approach this. But certainly, as you said, you know, every company, major company thinks of the next quarter. Every politician thinks of the next election. Exactly. And then, and then when you vote, you're not voting necessarily for 10 years worth of a certain person. You're, you're, you're voting about issues that are current to you, important to you right yes. now. So maybe that's our challenge. I want to take that opportunity that it's not going to be just politicians solving this. So I think it's going to be each individual person with our own actions. But also, I've had a chance, I've been fortunate enough to interact with various people in government. They react to us. We talk about a democracy and certainly, you know, people think, well, there's certain, you know, certain parties during certain ways and other ways. But in the end, they respond to us. We are the voters. So if we do if we want to have our voice heard, uh, then we have an opportunity. As physicians, surgeons, we have a lot of respect you know, when we speak. And, and I think it's good for us to, to use that and to, to highlight the various things that, that could be done. So you know, messages, the avenues for us to, to pursue. It's not just the government that's going to be. It's going to be our own choices. Perhaps we're fortunate enough, like we're, you know, do well financially in society. We could probably or are able to make some of the choices that need to be made with respect to, you know, less wasteful approaches. Uh, the World Health Organization has put forward 10 different things that you could do. Oh, maybe we can link that uh, in the description. One of the things you're very passionate about is providing timely orthopedic care to all in Canada. And this is actually something we've worked together on in terms of the virtual toolkit during COVID and, yeah. you know, for Bone and Joint Canada, yeah. things of that nature. So tell us about your mandate and your plans as COA president regarding this. Yeah. Well, a lot has happened to the COA since the pandemic. So I'll just take a second to backtrack. January 2020, the Canadian North Peak Association leadership got together to develop a strategic plan. Great. Everything put together, we identified a few important things like advocacy that would be important to implement. And of course, all that got put on hold for a while. So now we, you're using the expression standing on the shoulder of giants. I'm standing on the shoulder of giants of, you know, Dr. Kishore Mopuri, Dr. Lori Heemstra, who essentially, along with Cynthia Vizina, have uh, put the pieces in place to allow us to do some of the important mm -hmm. work. So, so my task, if we've looked like along the presidential line, has been kind of implement, like, you know, do things. So we've developed these various pillars of education, engagement, advocacy, and quality. Mm -hmm. And now these new committees have been organized, and then we're moving ahead with that. Now, having said that, we didn't wait very long for the advocacy piece. So 
So Chelsea Patrickwin has been uh, is is involved with our special projects within the uh, COA, and she's been quite active with various provincial organization mm-hmm. or even federal at the federal level to organize meetings to get the discussion going on advocacy. And mainly it's around access to care, right? right. Like as you said in, in Canada. So a lot has been happening in that sense. So so one of my jobs essentially is to continue some of that. Uh, I told you about a bit about sustainability. And the other piece that I wanted to bring together ties in a little bit to a certain extent with the advocacy is actually to grow the musculoskeletal team. So uh, we tend to work on our own as, as orthopedic surgeons when we talk about advocacy, but really in our everyday lives, we're interacting with physiotherapists, we interact with radiologists, we interact with physical medicine and rehab people. Why don't we do that as well at a bigger level? Yeah. Again, with the help of Chelsea, I've been uh, you know, working to set up a meeting with the leadership of Canadian Physiotherapy Association. We're going to meet with the physician assistants. We've met with the Canadian orthopedic technologists um, to talk about their work. We've met with, uh, with the physical medicine and rehab physicians, essentially to try to identify what our common grounds are and then maybe identify some initiatives that we could collaborate on. I think really if we uh, work, or work together, um, we, we have a much better voice uh, for our patients, a much stronger voice for, for our patients. That's amazing because it allows us to be unsiloed, for lack of a better word. You mentioned earlier that physicians can become great advocates because we do have a voice. And one of the arguments among physicians have been, well, we're a small voice, so are we really listened to? So this avenue seems to solve that because if we're getting together three or four or five or six different groups, we amplify that voice tremendously. So it actually sounds like with this, hopefully it's a great time for people who want to have their voice heard to get involved because the voice will get stronger. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and whenever we engage with an organization, they say, well, it'd be stronger if you spoke with us. And then we say, well, it'd be the same. (laughs) Exactly. And I think importantly, uh, focusing on the the, our common threat, which is the patient and the yeah. patient's care, is is the key piece there. So nobody is seen as kind of it's, they're advocating for their own party. That's, that's not what it's about. It's about patient receiving the appropriate care and timely care and coordinating that. So, yeah, why don't we just go one level up on that and find ways that we can collaborate together, advocate uh, together, see what the other organization, what their priorities are, what our priorities are, and then see how, how we uh, align and, and work together on that. That's the, the, my big move forward, I'm hoping, this year. So. Amazing. Tell us a little bit about Canadian Orthopedic Care Day, because you've been a huge advocate for that. Yeah, I'm a huge supporter of Canadian Orthopedic Care Day. Again, it's a you know, brainchild of the whole team at the COA to really identify a day in the year where we focus our attention in various uh, platforms, and, and a lot of it around social media, around uh, orthopedic patients who, who, need, uh, who need care. And uh, so it's every year, the last Wednesday of March. It's COCD, Canadian Orthopedic Care Day. And with, with a, a focus on our patients and their needs and, and the good care that they receive, I'm planning something special this year with, uh, with the fact that we'll have uh, new MSK providers involved. So Amazing. stay tuned for that. Amazing, that sounds excellent. Can patients get involved in that as well? Patients can get involved, they can support, I think. So certainly we like to have voices, patients' voices. Uh, that's been something that's always very, uh, very important. It's very effective. You've seen, well, from your experience in BC, you've heard Elaine uh, Dealwart, the president of our BC Orthopedic Association, uh, being very effective in telling patients' stories. Because I think once people understand that, uh, you know, bone and joint care, orthopedic care, is, is more than, you know, just an older person with arthritis, right? It's, also, it's everybody in society. It's, you know, kids getting the proper development for their bone and joint health uh, through surgery. It's uh, people requiring, uh, uh, you know, some athletic injury or rotator cuff repair, perhaps, that you would do, or a ligamentous surgery to their knee to allow them to go back to work. And, and of course, there's a whole population of patients who hit, need hip and knee replacements, about half of the people in Canada. In my subspecialty field, it's fracture care. Mm-hmm. So, but it could be elderly patients with hip fractures. It could be younger patients who need um, timely fracture care. So that's an opportunity, essentially, for us to highlight all the work that's being done. So having stories, patient stories, of receiving orthopedic care 
and that's changed their life. And I'm confident of that. Like, you know, if we look at the, the outcomes of patients requiring like non-urgent surgery, mm -hmm. that the, the outcome improvements are, are huge. Um, we've not been highlighted enough. We've not, either we've not done a good job at it, or we, we haven't been able to get some of the spotlight. Because, you know, in the current situation, our, you know, deciders, the, you know, decision makers have to take care of, you know, cancer, they have to take care of acute conditions, you know, for the heart or for the brain, like strokes, and, and that's all appropriate. We have to do that. But Canadians in general, you know, when what we've agreed on as a society is if uh, somebody presents to a hospital with an orthopedic problem and they decide on surgery, that 90% of them would receive their care in six months. Mm. It's not happening. So we have to make choices again to say, okay, how can we fulfill that promise? And how we fulfill that, to me, is, is, is being collaborative. That might be another thing as well. So, you know, collaborating with uh, decision makers. There are different strategies to do that. Some people have a shaming type approach. I don't think that's the way to go. I think it's for you to understand what they need to do, they need to decide, and for them to understand what the issue is, it's, there's an exchange there and in identifying that. But I think making sure that our patient population is a priority is our, our job. We've had previous guests say, you know, having a seat at the table and then having them walk a mile in our patient's shoes or our shoes and just kind of, as you said, getting them to understand it. So I think it's a much more effective way of advocacy. Yeah. So, yeah and, and we also understand as we sit in those meetings and we hear all the other decisions that those folks have to make, we appreciate. Yes. Yeah, okay, that's, that's important. Obviously, that those things are important. But we just have to make sure that in the person's knowledge of orthopedic care, they understand that there are a lot of people in pain, mainly pain, or have loss of function, who are waiting for an operation where we know the solution. Like, it's not like we're experimenting. Like, yes. they, we've decided that the operation would be the step. They've yes. tried the physio, they've taken pain medication, and maybe they're addicted to them. Mm. And, and then now we've come to the point where, yeah, we've decided it's an operation. Can we get on with it? So, and, that, and that's, I think that's important for us to do that. And this is where I think that having a voice as all musculoskeletal care providers is, is the right way yeah. to do that. And then I think it, I, our main focus is with orthopedic care, but also it's not reflected in the funding for orthopedic research. The importance of musculoskeletal burden, the burden of health, is, is much bigger than the proportion of funding that it receives every year. So that's, again, an, an opportunity for us to raise that, raise that awareness. Another component is, is education. So already something is happening at the COA. So again, a giant, Kishor Mopuri, during his presidential year, initiated the process of the orthopedic chairs of Canada. So all the heads of all the teaching programs across the medical schools across Canada getting together and identifying a curriculum for a medical school for orthopedic care. So what would be appropriate for that? What's really important for people graduating as you know MDs to have? You need this basic knowledge. Those are all avenues to pursue for us to, to have a bigger presence and for our patients to receive you know better care. You're starting from the ground up essentially and this is yeah. you've talked about something that's a very big passion of mine which is musculoskeletal training from medical school onwards for non-orthopedic surgeons yeah. which as you've touched on is minuscule yeah. yet it forms this massive part of people's practices. Yeah. Here at UBC, uh, we're actually trying to revamp not only the medical student educational program, but also the residency ones for family doctors. So I'm working with Lise LeVay for that. So that's a little plug for, for ourselves. But oh. it sounds like, you know, we're all, we're all on the same page, which is wonderful. That's um, amazing. That's great to hear. There's, I mean, there's, and there's different initiatives, you know, across Canada, you know, and, and hopefully this forum brings these uh, folks together. Everybody's developed some kind of solution over the years. You know, can we make that common? Can we make that really strongly supported? And, and then let's get that uh, out there and, and a priority for, for medical schools. So. Oh, it's wonderful. Thanks again for being here. You know, you've laid out um, an amazing game plan and opportunities for physicians now to get engaged in a more broad and, and larger scope. So if they want to do that, how do they reach out to either yourself or the COA? You can always reach out to the COA, certainly, and then the various you know groups. We do have representation in the four pillars that you know I talked about. You can always reach me, and I'm happy to uh, redirect. So Pierre.Guy at UBC.ca. But if it's something that you know already that you have your local representative or or uh, somebody who's representing you through one of the COA committees, and 
that's one of the ways to go. Wonderful. Thanks again for being here. It's a pleasure talking to you. Hey, thanks for doing our uh, Ortho Insider. I appreciate it.